this is chapters 111 to 115. 111. Her name is Clara Farwell. She probably looks a little different from the second grade photo Emily's mom showed us, but I still have something solid, even though it might not be her. The following Wednesday, I go six houses down and ask for Jamie, and his mom looks at me and smiles, then shouts over her shoulder and makes a face when he comes bounding into the hall. When he sees me, he blushes, and his mom's smile gets wider. I pull Jamie outside, close the door, and say, I need your help. Sure, he says, not asking why or what or when. I hide the grin, pushing hard against my lips, and say, I need you to follow someone. Okay. And then I smile anyway, because he's sweet and loyal, and I realize I love that about him. It's a girl. I need to know where she lives, but it means skipping school. I remember I remember Jamie's hand on my arm when he pulled me back from the alley, and when he chased Becca and Tarrant and their boyfriends away, although I told him, although I told him to leave. Jamie nods, and I wonder if he would literally do anything I asked. <laughs> but it's more than that, because I think if he asked, I would do the same for him. When? Friday. Mrs. Bradley will go bananas if I skip another day for no reason, so I need to be smart about this. I'll meet you at the Harmony side bus stop at 8.30, I say. As I'm about to leave, his mom steps into the street and says, Jessica, would you like to stay for dinner? Mom! Jamie, will, Jamie stares at her until she laughs. I'm just being polite, she says. Well, I wish you wouldn't. He looks embarrassed, and I should leave, but something else happens. Sure. It comes out by accident, and when Jamie makes a face, I shrug, think of the microwave meal waiting for me while Dad's at work, and say, what? And say what? I'm hungry. 2.12. His dad is sitting in the living room. Not 2... 1.12. Sorry. His dad is sitting in the living room, and when Jamie introduces me, he says, it's an honor to have a celebrity in our home. I can't tell if he's being sarcastic or weird, but the way Jamie rolls his eyes, it's probably the latter. I flash back to the moment I first saw him peeking through the curtains the night I met his son. He seems friendlier than the face I saw that night suggested, but he looks at me with an intensity I'm not used to, like someone who, who was never told it's rude to stare. He keeps straightening his glasses and squinting as if he's studying me. A couple of times, I fake a smile and he nods, but carries on staring, his fingers drumming the t-shirt that barely covers his belly. While we're waiting for dinner, Jamie takes me to his room, and his parents don't say anything. I wonder if taking random girls upstairs is normal behavior for him. But seeing how awkward Jamie looks when we're alone, and how long it takes him to decide where to sit, I don't think so. I look out his window and imagine him watching Michael walk past. There are binoculars on the windowsill, and when I hold them up, Jamie says, They're my dad's. It's easier to keep watch, you know, in case anything else happens. He's perched on the edge of his bed, so I sit up, so I sit on his desk chair and quickly wish I hadn't since it creaks every time I move. I try to stay as still as possible, feeling increasingly nervous and wondering why I agreed to this. Every time I catch Jamie's eye, he looks away, and the longer we sit in silence, the more awkward it feels. Almost every time we've seen each other, it's been too manic to focus on the small stuff. But sitting alone in his room, the small stuff suddenly feels enormous. His walls are covered with posters of The Umbrella Academy, his bookcase full of graphic novels and figurines. When he sees me looking, he grins and says, What do you think? It's not really my thing, but I smile and say, They're cool. This is Diego, Jamie says, holding, up, holding one of the models up. He's my favorite. I reach out, but he looks nervous and places it gently back on the shelf. So, Jamie says, Who are we going to follow? Her name's Clara, I say. She goes to Harmony Elementary. Cool, what's the plan? We wait for her to leave school, then talk to her. That's all. Jamie nods, like this is usual for him. Can I ask why? I tell him about Clara's phone call and explain why it's a two-person job. I need his help because even though we've never met, Clara would recognize me in a heartbeat. Plus, if letting, if school letting out is anything like St. Anthony's, it'll be chaos. We could leave later, but that would mean hanging around at home or sneaking out of school during lunch. If we go early, that's one less problem to deal with. When we're back downstairs, Jamie's dad winks at him, quickly losing his smile when he sees me looking. Dinner, his mom shouts, and the floorboards creak, and a boy and a girl appear out of nowhere. Hi, the boy says, just as the girl asks. Who's this? It's no one, Jamie says, and then, I mean, it's Jess. She's my friend. You're in that show, the girl says, and I nod and give Jamie a look because I have no idea who I'm talking to. 
This is Aaron and Henry. We're twins, Henry says. Our double delight, Jamie's mom says. His dad rolls his eyes and mumbles, more like her double despair. They look about nine, and I wonder why Jamie hasn't mentioned them before. But we haven't really talked about anything except me since we met. All through the meal, Jamie's dad talks about the show, and his mom keeps trying to change the subject. I knew your mother, his dad says, which catches me by surprise. The way Jamie looks, this is news to him, too. I'm sorry about what happened. Thank you, I say, feeling uneasy. I expect him to keep going, to try to... To try to ease the awkwardness by making it even more awkward, but he doesn't say another word. Eventually, I ask, how did you know her? He sighs and says, I used to go in the store where she worked. She was very friendly. When Jamie's mom mentions dessert, I say, I better go, but thank you. It was delicious. Outside, I remind Jamie about Friday, then say, did you know your dad knew my mom? No idea. Have you always lived in Doveton? Yep. We've been neighbors. We've been neighbors all along. If he knows what I'm getting at, he doesn't let on. He's hopping from one foot to the other, and I suddenly feel nervous for a completely different reason. Ignoring it, I say, do your parents watch the show? Only my dad. Mom's th Mom thinks it's exploitive. No offense. I laugh and say, none taken. I should go. As Jamie steps forward, I step back and say, see you soon. One thirteen. After school on Thursday, I greet my nan with a sad face and a sigh. What's wrong, she says, and when I tell her I'm not feeling well, she reaches for my forehead as expected. You don't feel hot. My head's pounding, I say, and my stomach doesn't feel right. She pours out the tea and sits across from me while I keep my head down, breathing deeper than normal, my eyes not quite as wide, my smile replaced by a grimace. If you are going to fake an illness, it's no good doing it on the morning of the day you want to stay home. Effectively skipping school requires preparation. You have to be willing to sacrifice the previous night if you want to get the next day off. So when Nan asks what I want for dinner, I say, maybe some soup. I'm not hungry. She looks more serious then because I always ask for soup when I'm sick. She touches my head again and even though the result is the same, she says, you do feel a little hot. I might go to bed, I say. This is... This is at 4.30 in the afternoon. I eat slowly, pretending I can only manage one slice of toast, then kiss her and dad and go to my room. I get ready for bed right away and read, pretending to be dozing, when I hear Nan Nan's footsteps in the hallway. The next day, when I tell her I'm feeling a little better and should probably try to go in, she's the one who tells me not to. She offers to come back and sit with me, and I tell her it's okay. I don't feel as bad as yesterday, I just need some sleep. What makes this plan perfect is that Friday is Nan's busy day, hairdresser in the morning, book club in the afternoon, and bingo after dinner. She hates missing it, and I tell her she doesn't have to. Any other day, she would ask to speak to Dad or tell me to carry to call her every hour, but instead she says, okay, get plenty of rest, I'll phone the school. Downstairs, I greet Dad with a smile and tell him how much better I'm feeling. It's a risk, but Nan won't call him because she knows he won't answer. And by Tuesday, I hope it's forgotten. At 3.30, Jamie is waiting for me at the bus stop. He has brought two packed lunches. 1.14. Harmony is slowly coming back to life after another winter. Hannah's ice cream parlor, like all the other shops and restaurants, is dusting itself off before the Easter break, gearing up for another manic summer. I'd like to go in because Hannah's dad will give us... I'd like to go in because Hannah's dad will give us free desserts, but her mom will ask why I'm not at school and I can do without a lecture. The wind coming in with the tide and the overcast sky mean sunbathing isn't an option. Not that I would do that with Jamie around. Instead, we walk the length of the beach, then up and along the sidewalk, staring out to where the sea meets the sky. It really is a beautiful place, so peaceful you can't help but imagine a better life if you let yourself daydream as the waves crash against the rocks below. I should come here more often, although if I did, maybe this feeling would wear off. Maybe magical places don't feel magical if the people don't feel magical to the people who see them every day. We find a beach and eat the sandwiches Jamie made for us, the gaps between our conversation getting bigger as we drift off into our own thoughts. When I look at him, he's staring out to sea with a smile on his face, and I don't look away until he turns and says, What? Nothing. I want to ask about his dad, after what he said about mom, but there are too many questions in my head right now, and I need to focus on Clara. Instead, I try to let my mind wander, remembering when we came here as a family, mom hurrying off, hurrying us from bed to car to beach, 
She loved it here. She called it her heaven. Doveton is home, but maybe Harmony could be my version of Mayfield Lodge. What do you want to do when you graduate, I ask. I'm going to college to study civil engineering. He says it so confidently, so quickly, that I can't help but look surprised. I don't know why, but I assumed he was as confused about the future as I am. What? he asks again. I smile and say, I didn't expect you to be so... clever? Grown up. Jamie laughs. It's what I've always wanted to do. I used to hate people like that. People who could talk you through their entire life before they'd finished school. There's a saying, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And when your mom is murdered, you know exactly what that means. But I'm starting to see a future through the mess of my life. I'm not planning, I'm imagining, and there's nothing wrong with that. What about you, Jamie asks. It was a question I always hated, but not today. I think of Bernie and Reg and Mr. Humphreys and Emily's mom, all these broken people I ignored because I was an acceptable kind of selfish. No one blames the grieving girl for only thinking about herself, but that doesn't make it right. I remember what Bernie said under the tree about her therapy sessions and say, I'm going to help people. I want to be a therapist. You'll be good at that, Jamie replies. You're so brave. It catches me by surprise, but I don't feel embarrassed. I feel proud. I hope he's right about being good at something because I've been thinking about it a lot in between all that's been happening. There's a job for me out there and I think I can make a difference. Even when everything has been eaten and I start to feel cold, I sit listening to the sea below and the birds above and the hum of everything in between. I wish mom were here to enjoy this place with me. If I close my eyes and think hard enough, I can remember burying, my, burying her legs in the sand and carving a mermaid tail. I can remember when she taught me not to be afraid of the ocean, diving headfirst into its vastness until I laughed away my fears. And I can remember dad piggybacking me along the boardwalk while he walked hand in hand with his soulmate in the calm before the storm. One fifteen. I show Jamie the image on my phone of Clara's old school photo and he stares at it for a long time before nodding and saying, got it. You sure? She's going to look older now. Yep, I'll recognize her. I need her to be away from the school, away from her teachers and her friends before I approach her. Jamie can wait by the front entrance with the other parents without being noticed, but I don't know how many of them watch my show, and I'm not prepared to find out. When we first arrive, there are only a few moms there, gossiping and paying no attention to us. We hang back until it starts to get more crowded, then Jamie takes a few steps forward while I pull my baseball cap low over my face and hope no one recognizes me. By 3 o'clock, the place is packed, and I'm glad I brought help. The youngest students come out the side entrance, all screams and giggles and hyperactivity. Then the older ones follow, and I try to find Clara without looking suspicious. I think I see her a couple of times, but a quick glance at my phone says otherwise. There are too many people all crowded together, and I start to panic. I can't even see Jamie now. I must look suspicious, a weirdo waiting outside of school for someone else's child. But then my phone buzzes. It's Jamie, and he says, Can you see me? No. I found her. Go left toward the bus stop. I do as he says, and when I see him, I follow at a distance, waiting, waiting until the group she is with starts to split up. Jamie looks over his shoulder and smiles, but I pretend we don't know each other. I still think Clara will run if she realizes how close I am. I'm lucky that she's a walker, not a bus rider, and that her parents trust her to come home on her own. When it's just Clara and one other girl talking loudly, like they don't have a care in the world, I catch up with Jamie and he grins, but doesn't say anything. The girls turn in a side street, and we follow until Clara waves goodbye to her friend and continues on alone. She reaches into her pocket, and I hear the jangle of keys, realizing she's almost home, that if I'm going to do this, it needs to be now. Stay here, I say to Jamie, and then I shout, hey, and speed up until I'm right behind her. Clara turns, and when she sees me, I know I have the right person. She looks terrified. <laughs>